elimination program by 2030. And HCV has uh, the direct antiviral agent, the development of it, DAA has uh, made a hu huge progress in the treatment of chronic hepatitis C. However, uh, in certain country, there's a still, uh, still, there is a still a very difficult task to re achieve the goal of the WHO to eliminate uh, hepatitis C by 2030. So today we will talk about the, the management of a residual HCC risk after SVR and the uh, elimination goal of HCV by the entering evolution of WHO. And the other, other important issue is that because hepatitis B virus infection is also very prevalent in the Asia country. So we will also talk about the uh, update uh, in, in the HPV and uh, HCV co-infection. So now we will ask uh, Professor Zhang to chair the first session. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Wan Long Zhuang from Kaohsiung Medical University Hospital, Taiwan. It's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Liu Junren. Professor Liu was graduated from National Taiwan University and obtained the MD and PhD degrees. His research interests focus on chronic hepatitis B and C, hepatocellular carcinoma, and non alcoholic fatty liver disease. He had authored more than 300 papers in top ranking journals, including GUT, Journal of Hepatology, Hepatology, and Gastroenterology. Now he is a professor at the Department of Internal Medicine, National Taiwan University College of Medicine, and the Director of Hepatitis Research Center, National Taiwan University Hospital. Today, he will give a talk entitled update evidence of short-term and long-term outcomes of HPV and HCV duly infected patients with curative HCV infection. Professor Liu, please. Thank you, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it is my great pleasure being invited to join this APASO webinar about recent advancement of HCV beyond cure. My task is to talk about the updated outcomes of HPV HCV confected patients post curative HCV treatment. I will briefly go through the updated epidemiology of co infection in Asia Pacific region, updating management of this patient population, short term and long term outcomes post HCV curative therapy. The prevalence of HPV HCV co infection is changing in Asia Pacific region. As shown in this figure, in Taiwan in the past, Around 0.9% of the community population had evidence of co-infection, and the prevalence is even higher in high-risk population. However, recent surveys are demonstrated that in people who inject drugs, the prevalence of co-infection decreased to very low. Similar situation was documented in HIV positive population. So overall, after the introduction of a HPV and mass vaccination, it is uh, expected that the prevalence of co-infection would be a decline uh, very rapidly uh, in the young uh, generation. For HPV or HCV endemic countries, actually uh, HPV HCV uh, co-infection is not uh, rare. This uh, figure shows that in Taiwan, uh, where HPV infection is endemic in the past, HPV HCV co infection can be uh, documented in about 0.9% of the adult uh, population among uh, seven uh, counties uh, surveyed for HPV uh, infection. In this uh, survey, the collected uh, patient can be uh, classified into a virus negative, virus mono infection, or co infected uh, patients. 
and as shown in this cartoon, you can see very uh, clearly that uh, in comparison uh, to patients without HBV or HCV infection, uh, to patients uh, with uh, HBV mononfection, to patients with HCV uh, mononfection, actually the co-infected patients are at a, a higher risk of HCC uh, development. And this uh, phenomenon uh, was documented in all adult uh, population across uh, various uh, age uh, categories. So from the background uh, AP uh, data, uh, for the adult uh, population uh, born before the era of uh, HPV vaccination, uh, I think you can agree that for HPV endemic countries, a population uh, co-infected with patients is not rare, and uh, they are at a higher risk of liver disease progression. So active treatment is needed for this uh, population, and uh, preferentially, uh, both viruses uh, should be treated at the same time. So in the following, I will show you uh, the data uh, using PECRIBA and then using DAA to treat uh, this uh, special population and uh, their short-term and uh, long-term outcomes. About 20 years ago, percolated interferon plus uh, recovery uh, combination therapy uh, was introduced uh, for the treatment of HCV uh, infection. Taking this opportunity, we use a similar genotype-based uh, regimen to treat HCV infection in co-infected uh, subjects. And our data show that for the mono-infected uh, patients, the SVRA was quite high for both genotype 1 and the genotype 2 3 uh, infected patient. And for HBV co-infected uh, patient, the uh, SVRA was uh, similarly uh, high. For genotype 1 co-infected patient, 72% uh, SVRA, and uh, for genotype 2 3 uh, co-infected uh, patients, uh, SVRA 83%. Uh, percent. For this uh, trial population, we follow this patient uh, for five years after the end of therapy, and uh, we found that HCV SVR uh, was durable in HCV uh, mono-infected uh, patients as well as uh, in co-infected patients. Apart from the control of HCV uh, infection, uh, PEC and nephron is also an approved agent for the treatment of uh, HBV uh, infection. So for the co-infected subject, after pec therapy, our follow-up data demonstrated that about 5% of the subject each year lost uh, HBS antigen after uh, the treatment with uh, PEC and nephron. And uh, overall, 30% of the subject clear the HBS antigen uh, at five years after the end of therapy. Apart from the virology outcome, we try to clarify whether anti-HCV therapy can improve the clinical outcome of the co-infected uh, patients by using a population-based uh, retrospective cohort. And uh, our data show that in comparison to the uh, 19,000 untreated co-infected patients, actually the clinical outcome of the 1,100 treated subjects uh, was uh, improved. Of course, mortality are uh, lower liver-related mortality lower, and the instance of HCC uh, also are uh, lower. However, in this uh, retrospective uh, core study, we cannot clarify whether the liver outcome uh, was different between patients uh, who achieved the HCV SVR in comparison to those without the HCV SVR. To address uh, this issue, Professor Yu and Professor Ye from Kaohsiung Medical University conducted a very large real-world cohort study. They collected 7,000 HCV mono-infected patients and 700 HCV HPV co-infected patients. All received interferon-based therapy and were followed for a median of 4.4 years. And this table shows you the baseline features of the HCV mono-infected and uh, co-infected uh, patients. The co-infected uh, patient can be uh, divided into a uh, SVR group and a uh, non-SVR group. And from this uh, figure, you can see clearly that the liver outcomes, including major liver complication, development of HCC and uh, liver decompensation, 
the risk was uh, much lower in the SVR group in comparison to the non-SVR group. And the factors associated with uh, major liver uh, complications include age, BMI, high fit for level, and uh, lower creatinine uh, level. So uh, from these findings, uh, we can conclude that interferon-based therapy reduced the long-term risk of major liver complication, particularly among those with uh, HCV SVR. However, there is still risk of liver-related complication, so post-HCV SVR surveillance is mandatory uh, for this uh, high group of patient. So overall, for uh, HCV HPV co-infected patient, our serial uh, study and publications uh, demonstrated that by using PEC interferon plus uh, rebarbering, in the short term, the HCV SVR uh, can be achieved in the majority and the SVR was durable. And the S antigen uh, could be cleared uh, in 30% of the co infected patient within a five year follow up. In the long term, the overall survival was improved, liver related mortality was uh, decreased, and the HCC uh, development was also uh, decreased. The outcome was uh, better among those patients with uh, HCV or SVR. Although PEC interferon and the rebar combination therapy had been shown to be effective for the treatment of co-infected uh, patients, however, there are several uh, limitations, uh, including its uh, inconvenience, uh, adverse effects, and uh, some patients may not uh, tolerate the treatment or response uh, to the combination uh, therapy. Fortunately, since uh, 10 years ago, Direct acting antiviral agent had been introduced uh, for the treatment of uh, chronic hepatitis C. This uh, new regimen had been shown to be very effective and uh, convenient. So, for co infected patients, uh, we are also uh, interested in uh, uh, demonstrating uh, its benefits uh, for the treatment of co infected uh, patients. However, since uh, DA has no effect on HPV replication, we are also concerned about the risk of HPV reactivation. To clarify uh, this issue, we conducted a multi-center uh, clinical study in Taiwan. We used a sofosbuvir ledipasvir fixed dose uh, regimen uh, for 12 weeks uh, for the treatment of hepatitis C and hepatitis B uh, co-infected uh, patients. In that uh, time, uh, this uh, new regimen is very uh, effective for the treatment of HCV uh, genotype 1. In this study, we aim to uh, clarify the effect of this uh, regimen for the treatment of HCV in co infected patients. We hope to clarify whether HPV co infection will impact HCV SVR. In this study, we also aim to clarify whether this uh, regimen uh, was effective for the treatment of HCV uh, genotype 2. And this uh, figure shows you uh, very clearly. Uh, totally, we collected 111 uh, patients, including uh, genotype 1 and uh, genotype 2 uh, patients. By using 12 week uh, software lady uh, fixed dose regimen, the results show that all patients uh, achieved HCV SVR 12 weeks including all genotype 1 patients and all genotype 2 patients uh, co-infected with HPV. To clarify the risk and profile of HPV reactivation uh, in this population, we follow the HPV uh, DNA profile during DNA therapy and uh, for 108 weeks after the end of DNA therapy. In the left panel, you can see uh, the risk and profile of virological reactivation. The virological reactivation are indicated by serial HPV DNA increase for more than one log or become uh, detectable. The risk mainly occur during uh, the DNA therapy, about 40%, uh, and increase to about 70% uh, uh, within one year after the end of DNA therapy. After one year, uh, virological reactivation uh, risk is very uh, uh, limited. In contrast to the virological reactivation, clinical reactivation indicated by a serum ALT elevation also occur during the DA therapy within one year and even within two years after the end of DA therapy. 
overall, the risk of uh, clinical reactivation was about 10%. Uh, Based on the data using DA uh, therapy to treat uh, co-infected patients, we propose the following uh, treatment guideline for uh, co-infected patients. For all subjects positive for serum HBS antigen and HCV RNA, we can use uh, DA therapy for all uh, co-infected populations, including uh, those are not eligible for pec ribar combination therapy, liver transplant recipient, and even decompensated liver cirrhosis subjects. This regimen can replace pec ribar combination therapy. However, for uh, decompensated liver cirrhosis, we should uh, avoid under 3 4 a protease uh, inhibitor in the combination uh, regimen. From pec ribar to uh, DA-based uh, therapy uh, for co-infected patients, the benefits are summarized in the, this table. By using DA-based uh, therapy, the HCV SVR uh, is found to be uh, very high. HBS antigen seroclearance may not be uh, likely to occur because of its uh, limited uh, effect on HPV reactivation. Data show that the risk of HPV reactivation was higher and uh, may occur earlier in comparison to interferon-based therapy. Fortunately, uh, DA-based therapy can be applied to all special uh, populations. So this data supports that HBV co-infection does not affect HCV uh, SVR. HBV may reactivate post-HCV cure, either by DA-based therapy or by interferon-based therapy. So how to prevent HBV reactivation uh, become an important issue uh, to be addressed in co-infected uh, patients. The risk of HPV reactivation in co-infected uh, patients had been documented in many retrospective cohort and uh, even prospective cohort studies. One recent uh, real-world data uh, published from uh, Taiwan, uh, Kaohsiung very beautifully uh, demonstrated that the uh, HPV uh, reactivation may occur and even may lead to uh, risk of uh, liver decompensation or needing uh, liver transplantation. In this uh, study, um, about 50% uh, of the subject HPV uh, was uh, profile was uh, stable after uh, DA therapy. However, 40% of the subject experienced HPV reactivation, and uh, some experienced severe uh, clinical failure and uh, even uh, encounter uh, death. Fortunately, about 10% of the subject uh, had a uh, HPS antigen uh, loss during a long-term follow-up. Although HPV reactivation is quite common and can be uh, severe, how to prevent HPV reactivation in co-infected patients remains an unsettled issue uh, according to uh, AA and uh, ESO recommendations. To clarify whether uh, the HPV reactivation can be prevented by using a nucleoside analog for HPV replication, we conducted a multi-center study uh, in Taiwan. In this prospective clinical trial, we collected uh, 58 subjects and randomized into three groups. Group 1 received DA-based therapy only for co-infected patients. Group 2 uh, patients received uh, DA therapy, uh, also a uh, 12-week uh, intercovial therapy uh, during the uh, DA treatment period. And the group 3 subject received 12-week DA therapy plus 24-week uh, uh, intercovial therapy. And uh, the intercovial therapy was given uh, at the same time uh, of the DA therapy. And all patients were followed uh, for uh, one year after the end of therapy. And from uh, the right side uh, figure, you can see that by using uh, DA therapy only, similarly, 50% uh, of the subject uh, experience HPV reactivation during the DA uh, therapy period. However, by using intercovial prophylaxis, none of the subjects uh, experience HPV reactivation. At the end of uh, intercovial prophylaxis, patients may still encounter uh, the HPV reactivation later. So from uh, multi-center clinical trials data in Taiwan, the virology outcomes after pec ribar and the DA-based therapy can be obtained and compared uh, in this table. As for HCV-SVR, 
it's very high after uh, using DA-based therapy for co-infected patients. At the Pegariba therapy, 2% of the subject experience HCV recurrence. As for HBS antigen zero clearance, by using Pegariba therapy, 5% per year achieve HBS antigen loss, and the rate uh, was uh, up to 30% at the end of five-year follow-up. In comparison, only few subjects uh, experience HBS antigen uh, loss after DA-based therapy. And for HPV virological reactivation, the rate was higher after DA-based therapy, 73%, and for PEG-RIBA therapy, about 62%. At the DA-based therapy, uh, risk of HPV reactivation higher and occur earlier, about 60% during DA therapy, and only 40% uh, uh, during PEGRIBA based therapy. Apart from the virologic outcome, we are concerned about uh, the heart uh, clinical uh, outcome, including uh, HCC development. In HCV mono-infected uh, patients, uh, after using DA-based therapy, current data suggested that uh, the risk of HCC was uh, marked uh, decreased, particularly in the uh, non-severe uh, liver fibrosis uh, subject. However, for co-infected patients, whether DA-based therapy can improve the uh, long-term liver outcome uh, remain a uh, prolonged uh, clinical follow-up uh, to clarify. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, based on the data I just uh, presented, I hope you can agree that the prevalence of uh, HBV HCV co-infection is uh, changing in Asia Pacific region. After the mass vaccination program for HBV, co-infected patient uh, population is uh, declining. The co-infected patient can be treated by using the same uh, regimen as a HCV mono-infected patient. SVR rate was uh, very high after using DA-based therapy. HBV reactivation uh, is still a concern uh, to be uh, paid attention. And uh, our data show that prophylactic NUC can effectively prevent the DA, uh, HBV reactivation during DA uh, therapy period. The short-term uh, virological outcome was documented uh, for uh, DA-based uh, therapy. The long-term outcome however, remain to be clarified in future prospective study. Finally, I would like to welcome all of you to attend the uh, uh, 2022 APASO Single Topic Conference on HCC to be held uh, next week. I thank you for your attention. Now we proceed to the next talk um, by uh, moderate by Professor Kurosaki. Professor Kurosaki, please. Ah uh, yes, thank you. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure and honor to serve as a moderator in this uh, Apostle webinar. I would like to introduce Professor Chang Fon Fan. Uh, he is a professor of the Kaohsiung Medical University and the director of the Hepatobilia Division of the Department of Internal Medicine, Kaohsiung Medical Hospital. Uh, he serves as a guest editor of uh, OBM Hepatology and Gastroenterology, and he's also an editorial board member of the World Journal of Gastroenterology and the review editor of the Molecular and Cellular Oncology. Uh, his research focuses on liver disease, including viral hepatitis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, the topic uh, that uh, Professor Huang will talk about today is the management of residual SCC risk in the post SCV SVR era. So, uh, Professor Huang, could you please start your lecture? Thank you, Chairman, for your introduction. This topic I will present is entitled Management of Residual HCC Risk in the Post-SVR Era. 
This is the HCCC world map regarding the prevalence and etiology. HCV is the major etiology of HCC in West Africa, North America, and Japan. Notably, one third of the HCV patients live in Asia, and HCV related HCC remains the major disease burden in Asian population. Regarding the etiology of HCC in Taiwan, HVV is the leading cause of HCC followed by HCV. However, as shown in the right panel, the proportion of HVV related HCC is decreasing, whereas the proportion of HCV related HCC is increasing in the past two decades. The HCV related hepatocarcinogenesis is multifactorial. HCV core protein with down regulated tumor suppressor gene promotes activation of oncogenes, dysregulation of apoptosis, reactive oxidation species, and formation and immune dysregulation. Genetic predisposition, such as TLR1 genetic uh, variants and epigenetic modification that cause downstream um, in genetic instability uh, play a role. And liver fibrosis and insulin and signaling pathway would also the cause of HCC in HCV patients. In the early era of DAA therapy, questions arise whether DAA is as effective as uh, with the interferon uh, in terms of HCC risk reduction. And in this meta-analysis, compared to patients who receive interferon based therapy, the risk ratio of HCC was 2.77 in DA treated patients. However, uh, DA treated patients are uh, often older, had more advanced liver fibrosis, and have uh, with their relatively a uh, short follow up period after viral eradication. After adjusting these confounding factors, we can see that DAA is as effective as uh, interferon in terms of HCC risk reduction. And take this study, for example, uh, that include more than 21,000 patients from Vatarian affair system. Uh, the HCC risk could be reduced up to 70% either in non-cirrhotic patients or cirrhotic patients uh, who receive DAA. And the uh, risk ratio reduction was similar to uh, those who received interferon-based therapy. There remains controversy regarding the HCC risk reduction uh, in the compensated patients who may have already passed the point of no return in this study with a relatively uh, short follow-up period. And the uh, incidence of CC did not uh, differ uh, in DAA-treated patients as compared to those untreated. Recently, the reports uh, in uh, APASO 2022 has shown that among uh, the decompensated uh, liver cirrhotic patients who received DAA, the all cause mortality could be reduced to, uh, up to 49%, and 31% of HCC risk could be reduced in decompensated patients receiving DAA. However, as shown in the lower panel, uh, the study results are quite heterogeneous among studies. So, a further study uh, involving uh, more patients and a longer follow-up period is warranted to clarify this issue. Some studies stress the importance of the non-characterized liver nodule as the risk of HCC after DA treatment. These three studies uh, show that uh, compared to patients without liver nodule, uh, patients with non-characterized liver nodule defined by EOB MRI, contrast CT, or discharge before DA treatment had a higher risk of HCC development. And shown in the right side panel of the HCC patients, uh, cancers are from uh, the non keratocyte liver nodule uh, usually happen sooner or quickly after the treatment, indicating that we should also pay more attention uh, to the so-called non keratocyte liver nodule or dysplastic nodules uh, before uh, uh, starting the treatment and after the treatment. 
What about the incidence of HCC after HCV cure by DAA? The recent systemic review and meta-analysis including more than 27,000 patients from 31 studies has shown that the incidence uh, in cirrhotic patients was 2.99 per 100 per person years. And of the 11 study with non cirrhotic data available, the incidence was 0.47 uh, per 100 person years. Of noted, uh, the incidence uh, among the F3 fibrosis was 0.63 per 100 person years. Uh, so the authors conclude that SCCC surveillance may not be needed among F3 patients because of relatively low incidence of HCC. Of particular note is that uh, the incidence in cirrhotic patients vary uh, among our studies with different follow up period. Uh, for example, uh, for studies with the follow up period less than one year, the incidence of HCC among cirrhotic patients may be as high as, as 6.2 per year. Uh, however, uh, for patients, uh, for studies with the longer follow-up period, that is more than three years, uh, the incidence could be uh, 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 down to 1.8 per year. As we know, the fibrotic status is critical in determining HCC risk. However, uh, the fibrotic uh, status may be uh, different before and after viral eradication. So the impact of fibrotic modification on HCC risk is critical. Uh, the direct evidence may come from our previous study enrolling 265 uh, patients uh, with pair biopsy before and after achieving SVR. As we can see in the left side panel, uh, the risk of HCC was lowest in patients with persistently myofibrosis as shown in the pink line and we set it as a reference. And the risk of HCC could be uh, significantly reduced in patients with improved liver fibrosis, as shown in the green line. However, uh, the HCC risk uh, uh, increased uh, significantly uh, for patients who uh, have worsening liver fibrosis, uh, even if they achieve SVR, as shown in blue line. And their risk of HCC did not differ as significantly compared to patients who had persistently uh, advanced fibrosis as shown in the purple line. So the uh, post-treatment uh, fibrotic status uh, may be a more determined layer pre-treatment status in predicting HCC risk. Similarly, as we can see in this study, uh, in the right side panel, compared to patients uh, with persistently a low fit four score, uh, highlight in blue. Uh, those uh, with an increased fit four score, uh, either uh, by DNA or interferon therapy, had a higher risk of SCC development uh, regardless of their cirrhotic status. Importantly, on the left side panel, the HCC risk uh, may persist up to 10 years, uh, in particularly for patients with baseline liver cirrhosis or persistently elevated a fit four score, indicating that we should keep a close and persistent a monitor for those are with advanced liver fibrosis. There are some tools being developed uh, to estimate FCC risk after achieving SVR. For example, uh, some simplified FCC scorings a uh, biomarker and surrogate markers such as FIT4 or uh, image based modality such as fiber scan. They are readily available and increasingly common. However, they are not specifically developed for FCC prediction and they may be less accurate. Some studies use multivariable regression models to create so called FCC risk calculators and they may be more accurate than simple score. However, uh, they require special tools to calculate, such as web-based calculators. And more recently, uh, studies have using deep learning HCC risk uh, prediction models has been uh, developed, such as using a recurrent neural network. Although they may be hard to implement in the clinical practice, they have been shown to be more accurate 
than traditional regression models with a better uh, performance. For example, the AMAC risk score are using uh, age, gender, albumin, total bilirubin, and plate count as the covariant. Uh, pa patients could be uh, categorized into three risk groups uh, based on their HCCC instance. And this may help the clinician to guide how to monitor uh, their patients in the post area. era. Uh, not only for HCV patients, this risk scoring system can also be adapted to patients with HPV infection or patients with non-viral etiologies. Another example is this uh, VM model calculator. Uh, the uh, variable uh, include uh, cirrhotic status, yes or no, as well as status, yes or no, age, gender, BMI, uh, ethnicity, genotype 3, yes or no, and predator count, also the biochemical data such as ST, ALT, albumin, INR, hemoglobin. After uh, you uh, put in all the data into the calculate, uh, you will gain a three-year HCC risk for your patients, which may help you how to monitor your patients. And importantly, HCC may occur in uh, lung cirrhotic patients. Take our uh, recent study, for example, uh, we uh, compare the HCC patients uh, in uh, patients with or without viremia at the time of HCC diagnosis. And patients with post SVR HCC as shown in the red line has a better overall survival uh, than uh, those uh, with viremic HCC. And importantly, 20 to 30 percent uh, of the patient uh, may not have cirrhosis at baseline. And at the time of HCC diagnosis, 30 to 40 percent of the patients uh, were with the uh, mild or no serious uh, fibrosis in the lung tumor part. So in our daily practice, we may encounter patients uh, who has only very mild liver fibrosis before antiviral therapy or even at the time of HCC diagnosis. And they may be young and they may have no any other risk factors. As mentioned earlier, the genetic predisposition or epigenetic modification may play a role. Diabetics may play another important role in SBR patients uh, with minor liver disease uh, regarding HCC development. Uh, based on our previous study, we can see that apart from the other three subgroups, a patient with uh, diabetes has 3.794 of HCC risk compared to those without diabetes in SBR patients uh, with a minor liver fibrosis. Furthermore, while we adapt OGTT uh, to our HCV patients uh, before antiviral therapy, patients with pre-diabetics are uh, defined by OGTT has even higher risk of HCC uh, compared to the normal glycemic patient with the hazard ratio of 3.6. And there exists a dose-dependent manner regarding HCC risk upon patients with diabetics, pre-diabetics compared to normal glycemic patients. Here are the reports of some risk factors or surrogate markers of HCC in SVR patients without liver cirrhosis. Basically, they can be categorized into two parts. One is uh, fibrosis-related surrogate markers, such as age, pre count, pre or post-treatment, pre or before, albumin level. And the other part is non-fibrosis-related surrogates, such as diabetics, HCV genotype 3, TLL1 uh, genetic polymorphisms as denoted from a GWAS study. Let's take a look at how the regional guidelines suggest uh, to monitor HCC in SVR patients. The APASO 2017 recommended that uh, surveillance is, is suggested in SVR patients with any histologic stage of HCV with comorbidities, such as alcohol abuse and diabetes. And ESO 2018 suggests that patients with unknown to moderate fibrosis uh, with SVR and no ongoing risk behavior should be discharged, provided that 
they have no other comorbidities. They further stated that patients with advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis with SVR should undergo surveillance for HCC in the final version. And the AAS studies that led uh, uh, for non stroke patients, uh, the follow up uh, is the same as if they were never infected. And HCV surveillance uh, is recommended only for patients with cirrhosis. This table summarized the difference of the screen targets and strategy uh, among the three guidelines. The apostle suggests uh, all the SBR patients should receive screen in the post SBR era, and the ESO suggests screen for S3 and F4 patients. And ASOD suggests screen uh, for cirrhotic patients. As for the screen intervals, the apostle suggests that for patients with F0 to 2, uh, HCC screen uh, should be uh, done every six months for two years and then every 12 months. For patients with F3 and 4, an HCC screen should be uh, done every six months as with the other two regional guidelines. As for the modalities, sonography is the gold standard of the screening tool. And Apostle suggests adding uh, tumor markers, including alpha-fetoprotein, PBAC2, and AFBL3. And ESO doesn't uh, suggest uh, uh, using a biomarker as the SEC screening. And, and ASD uh, post a neutral position that is FP uh, can be used uh, in a screening. Notably, the apostle doesn't have a definite definition of fibrotic stage. Instead, the ESO and the AAS study have a, a definition of liver cirrhosis uh, by clinical uh, uh, interpretation, uh, histology, or uh, image based modality uh, with different cover of value and before or after. And only ESO have a definition of a three by using histology or image based modality. The Taiwan Association for the Study of the Liver made a consensus regarding post SVR HCC surveillance. Uh, for patients with F2 fibrosis or with HCC risk factor, as shown in the right side panel, HCC surveillance uh, should be uh, recommended uh, by ultrasound at an interval of every 6 to 12 months. For patients with F3 and 4 fibrosis, HCC surveillance uh, should be more closely uh, with the interval of every 3 to months uh, with ultrasound. Lastly, regarding the issue of HCC recurrence FDAA and this individual patient data meta-analysis including 977 DAA treated patients from 21 studies has shown that the incidence of HCC recurrence was 20 per 100% years, which was similar to a propensity score uh, DAA and exposed control though the survival benefit was not shown. The risk factors for HCC recurrence include the number of previous recurrence, the ECOG status, baseline AFP levels, and prior tumor burdens. So it is also very important to monitor HCC recurrence FTDA treatment. For example, the apostle has recommended uh, surveillance of HCC recurrence every four months after DAA treatment. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is my conclusion. HCV eradication by antivirals, either interferon or DAA, uh, greatly reduces the risk of HCC. However, uh, HCC remains to occur in a subset of patients, and the risk may persist for decades, in particular uh, for patients with cirrhotic or uh, advanced uh, fibrosis. HCC predictors uh, uh, can be generalized and categorized as fibrotic based, model based, or machine learning based studies. And based on these predictors, patients with high risk characteristics should be monitored for HCC indefinitely. Uh, however, for patients with so called low risk uh, factors, uh, HCC surveillance shall also be adopted on an individual basis beyond the issue of, of cost effectiveness in the clinical setting.
With that, I will thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Huang, for your uh, very comprehensive and uh, informative lecture. Uh, you talk about uh, several risk factors for HCC even after it's we are, and uh, important. You gave us a very important message, and uh, I look forward to have a, a discussion uh, later in the uh, panel discussion session. And I would like to hand over the moderator to Professor Wei to moderate the next session. Oh, so and the dear chair and the ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite and the next speaker. Uh, next speaker is Professor and Dr. Uh, Usmawati and Binti Muhammad. And the Professor Muhammad is the Ola Professor in the Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, and from in the University of Malaysia. He also got a, a, a many and the publication and the Ola's. And so please welcome and Professor uh, Muhammad. Thank you, Professor Wei for the kind introduction and thank you very much to the organizers for the kind invitation to give this talk. Let me try to share my screen. Okay, uh, let's get this going. Without doubt, varapatitis is the pandemic with the greatest potential for elimination by the year 2030. Several countries are on track towards meeting the 2030 hepatitis C elimination target. Now, noteworthy, the global target of the SDG to reduce the incidence of hepatitis B has been met in 2020 as measured by the prevalence of HBS AG to less than 1% amongst children younger than five years. Now let's remind ourselves what was the catalyst in the viral hepatitis response. The adoption of the first ever global health sector strategy for viral hepatitis in 2016 signaled the greatest global commitment to viral hepatitis with the ultimate aim of eliminating viral hepatitis as a major public health problem. So if the global hepatitis elimination targets are achieved, it can potentially lead to a 65% reduction in hepatitis B and C deaths by the year 2030. Despite the impressive progress in many areas of the viral hepatitis response, there is still an enormous burden of viral hepatitis worldwide, with 296 million people living with hepatitis B and 58 million with hepatitis C. Now, the number of people dying from hepatitis B and C remains daunting at 1.1 million per year, 820,000 from hepatitis B and nearly 300,000 from hepatitis C. The improved data shows that there are 3 million new hepatitis B and hepatitis C infections per year. So to reach the 2030 ambitious goals, we need to accelerate progress, address specific gaps in implementation, and bring innovation to scale across the entire viral hepatitis care continuum. Now, at the country level, this requires a national action plan with good data to ensure development of a costed national strategy. Now, a key goal of national viral hepatitis elimination programs is to reduce viral hepatitis transmission 
and liver-related mortality such that hepatitis ceases to be a public health problem. In addition to the impact targets, there are also the service coverage targets, five in the area of prevention and the other two on testing and treatment. So the interim impact targets at 2020 has enabled the tracking of countries' progress towards these elimination goals. So this table shows the report card on hepatitis elimination in the WHO Western Pacific region in 2019. Now prevention is on track apart from harm reduction. Now, strikingly, there are still major gaps in hepatitis B and C testing and treatment. A similar picture was seen at the global level and other WHO regions with major gaps in harm reduction, hepatitis B and C testing and treatment uptake. So in general, the global response is off track and most hepatitis elimination targets for 2020 were missed. Although the 2016 to 2021 global strategies on HIV, viral hepatitis and STI were presented in three standalone documents, they share a common framework that promotes synergy across the diseases with five strategic directions. So the Global Progress Report in 2021 documents the implementation of the three separate stra global strategies and provide accountability for the main achievements and gaps to date. Now, the goal for the coming decade is to get back on track by increasing the equitable delivery of services for the three diseases. Now, this figure presents the accountability ratings for progress achieved under each of the global strategies towards implementing the priority actions under each of the five strategic directions of the strategies. Now, as previously highlighted, Hepatitis B is one of the first areas to reach the health SDG target for 2020, but huge gaps in diagnosis remain. There is a dramatic increase in hepatitis C treatment affecting mortality, which is shown on the next slide. So the data show that 9.4 million people receive treatment to cure hepatitis C. That is an almost tenfold increase from the baseline of 1 million at the end of 2015. Now, this scale of treatment has been sufficient to reverse the trend of increasing mortality from hepatitis C for the very first time. However, only 21% of people who have chronic infection with hepatitis C are diagnosed and 62% of those diagnosed received treatment. Now, price reductions have made hepatitis C treatment an affordable high-impact intervention. But the coverage needs to increase nearly six-fold in the next decade to reach the 2030 targets for elimination. Tracking countries' progress towards the hepatitis elimination goals has provided insights to the limitation of these targets. Now, the case for using absolute targets for elimination goals was proposed in this 2020 publication. Now, the existing targets compare a country's progress to, relative to its 2015 values, therefore penalising countries who started their programs prior to 2015, countries with a young population or countries with a low prevalence. Therefore, clearer targets are needed that can help measure progress towards true elimination. Now, countries 
are in the best position to select the mix of service coverage that will allow them to meet these revised global targets. In June 2021, WHO released interim guidance for country validation of viral hepatitis elimination with the inclusion of new absolute targets. So the main aims of the interim guidance include the place hepatitis elimination efforts within a public health perspective to help build capacity to address different country contexts and to implement control and elimination programs more efficiently. Although equivalent to the relative reduction targets originally defined in the 2016 Global Strategy, overall the 2021 guidance suggests the use of absolute impact targets with a set of programmatic targets. Now, the main impact indicators and targets for measuring hepatitis C elimination are defined as follows. An absolute annual HCV incident of less than equal per 100,000 person and of less than equal to 2 per 100 people who inject drugs. An absolute HCV-related annual mortality rate of less than equal to 2 100,000 persons. Although WHO strongly encouraged to pursue elimination of both hepatitis B and C together, which is option D, countries may choose to apply for one of the other three certification in the phase approach. Now, option A is elimination of mother to child transmission or EMTCT of hepatitis B or options B or C being elimination of hepatitis B or hepatitis C as a public health problem. Achievement and determination of elimination will require the availability in countries of high quality programs and a comprehensive system, which includes national serial surveys, surveillance for acute hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, infection and their consequences such as HCC and cirrhosis, and program data documenting prevention, testing and treatment. Now, noteworthy mathematical models can usefully complement the data collection in several areas to determine attainment of the country elimination target. Now, absolute incidence targets are proposed for the following reasons. Firstly, they enable direct comparison of progress towards elimination across countries. Secondly, baseline estimates of incidence in 2015 are either unavailable or likely to be inaccurate in many countries. Thirdly, absolute incidence impact target as a more direct relationship with the public health burden of HCV in a country or reflects the true public health problem. And lastly, an absolute incidence impact target aligns better with absolute validation targets for mortality. Let's now focus on the validation of reduction in HCV transmission and incidence. So the calculation of the absolute global incidence rate is based on the 80% reduction in the HCV incidence target. So using the WHO estimated global annual HCV incidence in 2015 of 23.7 per 100,000 people, the global annual incidence rate would need to decrease in the adult population to 4.7 new annual HCV infections per 100,000 people to meet this target of 80% reduction, rounding off to less than equal to 5 new HCV infections per 100,000 persons. 
Now, the rationale behind the specific absolute global target for people who inject drug is based on the model estimates. Now, 80% reduction in the annual incidence rate of 8.6 per 100 people who inject drugs in 2015 accounts thus for a global annual HCD incidence of 1.7 per 100 people who inject drugs for validation of elimination and running off to less than equal to two new annual HCV infections per 100 people who inject drugs. I will now switch gears to HCV-related mortality and the programmatic targets for validating the elimination of HCV mortality as shown on this slide. So the most important determinant of mortality in the short to medium terms is access to early diagnosis and effective antiviral treatment to prevent disease progression to cirrhosis, HCC and liver-related deaths. So it's worthwhile reminding us the attainment of SVR is associated with a near 90% reduction in liver-related death and 80% reduction in the incidence of HCC and a 75% reduction in all-cause mortality. So the new global health sector strategies for HIV, viral hepatitis and STI for the period of 2022 to 2030 was adopted at the World Health Assembly this year. The new global strategies aim to close the gap to 2030 and reignite momentum in the responses to these three diseases that have been eroded by disruptions to services during the COVID-19 pandemic. So unlike the 2016 to 21 global health strategies on HIV, viral hepatitis and STIs, which were presented in three standalone documents, the new 2022-2030 strategy is presented in a single document that includes both integrated and disease-specific content. The strategies aspire to a common vision to end epidemics and advance universal health coverage, primary health care, and health security through shared approaches for a people-centered response. So similar to the previous strategy, five strategic directions provide the overall guiding framework for country actions to implement the strategies. The integrated strategic directions will highlight synergies and provide guidance regarding how disease responses can be integrated and aligned with each other to increase efficiency, improve quality, accelerate progress, and ultimately achieve greater impact and more equitable health outcomes. Now, the successful implementation of these strategies rests on common drivers of progress, namely gender, equity and human rights, financing, leadership and partnerships. Closing the gaps between now and 2030 has the potential to save 2.3 million deaths per year from the three diseases including 500,000 deaths from hepatitis B and C related HCC. Now we can all work together to contribute towards the downward trend in the hepatitis C incidence and deaths as shown in the solid green and blue lines by implementing new actions. WHO has provided further guidance on hepatitis C simplified service delivery in the new HCV guidelines, which will be launched next week during the ESL Congress. The updated HCV guidelines focus on three specific themes that address the roles that countries, 
liver associations, and all of us should play in eliminating HCV. Conclude viral hepatitis elimination is indeed feasible, but it requires commitment and strategic shift towards elimination. The achievements to date have demonstrated that strong leadership coupled with innovative technologies and practices, as well as financial investment, can reduce disease transmission, improve treatment outcomes, and more importantly, saves lives. The objective of recommending absolute target is not to lower expectations or diminish the hepatitis elimination standards, but to provide clearer targets that recognize the past and current elimination efforts by countries and help measure progress towards true elimination. Now, acknowledging the commonalities and differences amongst the three disease areas, the 2022-2030 Global Strategies on HIV, Viral Hepatitis and STI provide a framework to combine shared and disease-specific approaches in ways that place people at the heart of the response with health equity and community engagement as strong principles. With that, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mohammed. Well, so let's say we are and the go to the panel discussing. And the, the chair, we are. Yes, uh, we will move to the final session of the panel discussion. The attendees, if you, you have any questions, you can uh, type in the Q&A box and uh, we welcome all the panelists to uh, discuss and raise questions to the speakers. Any question or comment from our panelists? Uh, Professor Yu, you, do yeah, you have any? I think uh, Professor George Lau have a very good question about the, the uh, the, about the first talk by uh, Professor Shida Liu. So uh, he asked that, is there any difference in post-SVRs, HB service antigen clearance between the PET-RIBA and the, the DAA regimen? So Professor Liu, could you please respond to this uh, question from uh, Professor George Lau? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Yu and uh, Professor Lau. Uh, for the co-infected patient by using PECRIBA plus uh, versus uh, DA-based therapy. Actually, the rate of HBS antigen loss uh, seems to be uh, slightly higher in the uh, PECRIBA uh, treated uh, group. And uh, for S antigen decline uh, rate, uh, it's uh, similarly uh, observed uh, apart from the S antigen loss. Yeah, so very simple. The PECRIBA treatment had a higher rate of S antigen loss and a uh, greater decline of HBS antigen level. Thank you. Thank Professor you, Professor Gao. Professor you have any questions? Comment? Yes, uh, I have a question uh, to uh, Professor Liu. So uh, thank you very much for your very excellent presentations. I have a question. The first one is, uh, when will you consider a long-term uh, new therapy uh, not just the prophylaxis uh, for the patient with HPV and HCV uh, co-infection. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Gao. Actually, for uh, my uh, thought, uh, for co-infected patients, after the eradication of the HCV, the main determinant of the long-term outcome will be the HPV uh, infection status, particularly when the uh, uh, similar to the HPV mono-infection, if the viral load is relatively high or if the fibrosis stage is uh, greater than uh, F2, 
uh, I think a long-term therapy may uh, uh, help uh, improve the long-term outcome of the coinfected patient, I agree, not only for prophylaxis. Okay, so my another question is to follow uh, George's uh, question. So uh, you mentioned that the interferon uh, have a uh, uh, higher uh, HBSNE decline uh, than uh, DAA. So can you uh, speculate or give us uh, the explanation why, why interferon? will have a better control of HBSAG uh, than uh, the nuke, than DA. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, PECA interferon uh, is uh, uh, an uh, antiviral agent, both effective for uh, HCV and HPV. So apart from the clearance of HCV, it can also uh, control the HPV uh, replication, improve the response. Uh, toward the uh, HPV infection. That's one uh, underlying reason why the SNA gene decline or loss rate will be uh, greater in the uh, pec riba uh, treating uh, cohort. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, right now I have a, uh, a question for the second speaker, Professor uh, Chuang Hong Huang. So uh, we know that the uh, patient with not for DNH, we have a higher risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, we also noted that the HCV infection have a higher uh, premise rate of not for D. So uh, can you tell us uh, how about the role of not for DNH on the instance of HCC after the DA uh, 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 induced SVR, especially among the patients? with low fibrosis status. Yes, thank you, Professor Yu, for your uh, very uh, important and very hard uh, questions. Actually, uh, until now, there is no uh, very uh, uh, strong evidence regarding the Lafort uh, related HCC in patients with HCV SVR. However, uh, from the literature review, we can uh, see that uh, among our patients, uh, with the mild fibrosis and they have a cure, curative HCV. A uh, patient with diabetes uh, or pre-diabetes are more likely to develop HCC uh, than those uh, with normal glycemia. And in addition, there is a very uh, cross talk between uh, insulin resistant diabetes and MAFOR. So I suggest that I propose to let a uh, patient, HCV uh, patient with MAFOR may have um, a more, uh, higher risk of, of HCC uh, than those that without MAFO. Uh, of course, that in, in need, uh, because the MAFO is the new definition of uh, fatty liver. So uh, it uh, gives us a, a very uh, a room to explore whether the combination with or without MAFO uh, is a, a predictor, is critical for HCC development. Uh, thank you. And the follow up, Professor. Follow up for the Professor Yu's question. I would like to uh, know your uh, recommendation for the uh, surveillance program for a patient with F0 of F1 fibrosis with diabetes compared to uh, F4 fibrosis plus diabetes. What's your uh, recommendation for the surveillance program? Thank you. Uh, I thank you, Professor Lin. Um, I think uh, everybody would agree that uh, for patients with liver cirrhosis, they should be monitored uh, indefinitely after SV cure. However, there uh, remains the debate regarding non cirrhotic patients because the different original guidelines have different opinions, even F3, F2, F, or Z0 to 2. And uh, one important issue is that uh, most of the suggestions are. I think it's based on cost effective analysis. So uh, it is not a different uh, uh, between uh, uh, resources, uh, regions with different resources. So uh, one may think that uh, the incidence of uh, uh, 1.5 per 100% year, uh, less than 1.5% is called, uh, is not cost effective. However, uh, it must depends on different uh, resource. Uh, for example, in Taiwan, uh, uh, the uh, surveillance is reimbursed uh, for every patient. Uh, so the uh, patient or the doctors are very happy or willing to receive uh, uh, post-SVR surveillance. So back to your uh, question, Professor Lin, 
uh, I think uh, uh, diabetes uh, indeed have a risk for HCC, uh, maybe due to an uh, insulin signaling pathway. So in Taiwan, I suggest that every uh, diabetes patient should receive uh, SVR surveillance regardless of their baseline uh, fibroid status. However, in other countries, uh, it may depend on their uh, healthy care support system to uh, see if it is cost effective based on their local reimbursements or government strategies. This is my answer. Thank you. Thank you. You have, you have a question from Professor Kurosaki. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation, for, uh, Professor Fang. Apart from the fibrosis stage or the presence of diabetes, you mentioned about age or high SDLT or gamma GTP. Uh, could you define the cutoff value of, uh, for example, age or cutoff value for SDLT or LT uh, to define the patients who could be discharged or who could have an intensive surveillance? Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Kurosaki, for your very uh, important question. Actually, I, I think it's a very difficult uh, uh, question to answer what about the color of value because the different populations of, uh, with the different HCC incidents may uh, come out a uh, different color of value uh, in the analysis. Uh, uh, in general, I think a patient who aged more than uh, 40 uh, uh, may possess a, a, a HCC risk uh, in our, based on previous uh, 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 studies. However, in, if the biochemistry data such as ST, LT, gamma GT, or AFP, uh, in my uh, opinion, uh, it may vary uh, between uh, different study populations. But uh, in general, the uh, color value we can uh, categorize e into a uh, pre-treatment value and post-treatment value. As with the HBV infection, the color value should be lower uh, in the post-treatment if you use the post-treatment color value. For example, FP, post-treatment FP, and maybe as low as 10 nanogram per milliliter and, and in predicted HCC. Uh, and and uh, if you use it, uh, as a pre-treatment value, uh, the color value may uh, be higher. This is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Professor Domenici have a question for you. Professor Domenici, yes. please. Thank you very much for all the speakers and also panelists. It is really excellent session. Uh, I have the question to Professor Liu. Uh, in your clinical practice, which one is the more effective drug among entecovir, TF, uh, and TDF regarding with the protection of HCC occurrence in patients with HPV infection? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Thomas. Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. However, we don't have the data comparing the efficacy of the prophylaxis among different uh, necrosis uh, analog. However, in my own opinion, there should be no uh, difference uh, regarding uh, uh, the, the potency of uh, various uh, nuke therapy. Uh, so in a uh, very simple, uh, no difference in my opinion. Thank you. Now we have Thank a person, much. Professor Kangda. Professor Kangda, please. Uh, I have uh, one question for Professor Xiang. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, how about uh, the uh, genetic morphism like uh, PNPL3 or uh, polygenic score for MAFRO-D? Uh, how about uh, your opinion, please? First of all, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Kanda, it's a very important uh, question regarding the genetic predisposition uh, in the uh, development of SCC. Um, based on a very important study in the Japan, we know that uh, the TL1 SMP uh, is a predictive of SCC in uh, SVR patients uh, uh, in the GWAS study. As for the uh, MAFO related or NAFO related SMP and a uh, study in the pathology also shown that uh, the PRS uh, may, uh, call, may also uh, determine uh, HCV related SCC. This is called a lipotoxicity related liver carcinogenesis. I think it's, yes, uh, it, uh, 
it 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 happened uh, in some uh, pay, uh, countries, but uh, it should also need uh, further validation in patients uh, with different ethnicities, such uh, as our Asian patients. Uh, the PRS uh, regarding the uh, fatty liver related uh, uh, SNP should be validated in our uh, Asian population and need a further clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the uh, Professor Gang. Professor, do you have any questions? Yes, yes, I have a question uh, to uh, Chan Fong. Uh, Chan Fong, enjoy your talk very much. So uh, from the literature review, all of us agree that the uh, baseline liver fibrosis is the most important risk factor for SCC development in SCB patients uh, who achieve uh, SVR. So in your opinions, uh, we know there is a novel biomarker, there is the M2BBGI, uh, which is a uh, a surrogate marker of liver fibrosis and is commonly used in Japan. Uh, so uh, do you think uh, the m 2 bbgi uh, can be a predictor for SCC development in SCB patients who achieve SVR uh, during the follow-up? Yes, thank you, Professor Gao, for your a very excellent question. Actually, uh, we are always uh, thinking about the best surrogate marker with a very uh, good uh, predictor, a very high accuracy and uh, to predict SCC. However, we may also need to consider uh, whether it, it's uh, cost-effective or it is uh, widely adopted or readily available in the clinical settings. And, and agree with you that uh, N2PPGI, especially in Japanese patients, have been proved to be uh, predictive of SCC in patients with uh, curative SCV. And, but uh, I think uh, it may, uh, uh, we, we may consider uh, whether it is also uh, can be generalized in our daily practice. Uh, from scientific view, view of points, I agree, and 2 bbp is predictive of SCC in SVR patients uh, from many uh, studies, especially from Japan. And, and however, in the real world, uh, we should also uh, pay uh, some attention or consider whether it can tap press to other circuits such as B4 or hyperscan or uh, cirrhosis, uh, any, uh, any other circuit markers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Because time is limited, uh, we have to move to the uh, question for the last talk. Any question to uh, Professor Ross Maramati uh, Mohamed? Yeah, may I ask one yeah, question? Um, well, a um, very important thing for preventing SCV infection is vaccination. I wonder when, when the vaccination developed, before 2030? I wonder if we are, you have any <laughs> suggestions. Yeah, um, um, it's not too exciting, unfortunately, in the development of uh, hepatitis C vaccination. We've not seen such a tremendous progress in this area, but we're still hoping that it will be developed before the 2030. So I think in the meantime, one greatest unmet need in terms of prevention for hepatitis C is the harm reduction program. Because in most countries, it is still the main driver of hepatitis C transmission. And that I think we need to optimize because most countries that have got a harm reduction program have not met the targets. And that can be seen very clearly when we actually were hoping to get in 2020, mm -hmm. 200 uh, needle and syringe sets per person. We are only achieving even less than a quarter of that in, in 2019. So we have a, a long way to go. So that will probably have to be optimized in the meantime. Of course, the other areas of prevention is equally important, but in terms of what is the driver transfer transmission in most communities, it will be in this group on people who inject drugs. Okay, thank you. And um, I think that it's the cheapest way to prevent the CV. That's uh, my notion. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, yes. Maybe we have a question from Professor Tomichi. Uh, professor Gao, do you have? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Professor uh, Rosmawati, I enjoy your talk uh, very much. So, uh, since you are the president of SAFEHEP, so would, I would like to have your expert opinions. 
So uh, in your opinions, uh, what are the most important and the feasible populations for SCV uh, micro elimination in the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, that's a very good question because what we are just seeing is that that has not been emphasized enough. So I think, again, we have to look at where the country data has been showing. And I think there is excitement to actually have this micro elimination in, again, people who inject drugs. But, but that has been only done in very few countries. Another group that we should be considering and is actually in the population who actually received dialysis in a, uh, in a sick and state uh, renal disease patients. Yeah, so because this group, uh, there's quite amenable to treatment nowadays, and even sofosbuvir has been shown to be safe in this group of patients. It's not uh, contraindicated as before. So I think we should look at some of these populations to actually consider, at least we cannot eliminate altogether in the country, just identify groups of patients, like you said, uh, to actually implement micro elimination. So I would think that again, people inject drugs plus also those in the dialysis population. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ross. Uh, because we almost out, run out of time. So I think I, I have stopped here and uh, make it a close uh, remark. So uh, in this uh, Apaso uh, Hepatology webinar, we have three uh, excellent speakers. Professor Dio demonstrated that the antiviral therapy could cure almost uh, HCV patients among HBV, HCV co-infection, but uh, the, it also might induce HIV reactivations, especially for the patient with advanced fibrosis. So we have to uh, uh, evaluate the risk of HIV reactivation and use the new polyphylaxis. Professor Huang talked about that the ICCC risk remain even after SVR by DNA therapy, especially for the patient with advanced fibrosis. And we have to follow this patient regularly. And also for the patient with my fibrosis, but have a, uh, some uh, risk such as diabetes, obesity, they are also at the risk of HCC and should be followed up regularly. And finally, Professor Ros Mawadi, Mohamed share with us about the interim progress of SCV uh, elimination globally and the new definition of goal for SCV elimination with episodic targets. So finally, I would like to thank the Apostle Steel Committee and the TASO Committee for providing such a, a great opportunity to develop the most updated data for SCV control. And also all of the speakers for their excellent talks and the, the moderator and also the audience for your active participation. The next Apaso uh, Hepatology webinar will be held on August 21st at uh, 2012 at the same time uh, start. So it's to focus on NAFOD and MAFOD. So I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think we Thank should you have a much. Good, good photo, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, please. <laughs> please. So, uh, Miss Indomie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. Good. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor Lin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Lin. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a nice bye. weekend. Yeah, have a nice weekend. Yeah. Lovely yeah. weekend. Yeah. Have a nice weekend.
My dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome all of you to join the 2022 APASO Single Topic Conference on HCC to be held in June in Taipei. This uh, hybrid conference will focus on the theme paradigm shift of HCC management across viral and uh, steatogenic carcinogenesis. There are tremendous achievements in the diagnosis and treatment of HCC. During this conference, you will be able to share your research findings with other experts and learn new knowledge in various aspects of HCC. As it's a hybrid meeting, you can enjoy all sessions and interact with your friends online easily. I'm looking forward to meeting my overseas old and new friends online and my colleagues in Taiwan physically. Finally, I hope all of you stay healthy and I hope to see you in person in the near future. On behalf of the scientific committee, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Apaso Single Topic Conference on HCC in Taipei, Taiwan. Under the theme of paradigm shift of HCC management across viral and cytogenic carcinogenesis, we will get together with clinical and basic researchers to exchange scientific information in HCC treatment. During this three days conference, I believe 2022 Apaso STC on HCC will be a perfect platform for insight sharing, IT interaction and collaborations among researchers and clinicians to shape a better future in HCC management. I cordially welcome your presence and wish you an enjoyable experience at this conference. Hello, it is my honor to welcome you to join 2022 Apazo Single Topic Conference on Hepato Zero Carcinoma in Taipei, Taiwan. With over 60 top-notch speakers from all over the world, the committee has put together an inspiring academic program. Besides lunch and evening symposiums, will be arranged as an interactive platform by new technology and knowledge sharing. Although many of you may not be able to visit Taiwan due to current travel restrictions, this hybrid conference will be a great connection between physical and online attendees. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. At 2022 Apostle Single Topic Conference on HCC.